Good morning again everyone. I'm back doing a long distance walk with Luke from the Real Traveller Amigos. Hey up. It's a lovely sunny day here. We're just over the border actually in Surrey but our walk is going to be in Kent. We are doing the Eden Valley Walk and it's from this book again. We've both got a book now, his and hers. <laughs> so it's the second like river valley walk in west kent that we're doing and the eden valley walk is 15 miles so i say long distance route it's not that long but it's a linear route we're going to class it as a mini long distance route so we're starting here uh basically between eden bridge and lingfield yeah yeah i've done a little day walk sort of around here before I think it was a, a Lingfield Surrey day walk with Candice. We are walking to Tonbridge. Is it Tonbridge or Tunbridge? Tunbridge. It's Tunbridge, straight away, schoolboy era. <laughs> Tunbridge. Tunbri it's spelt Tonbridge. Spelt Tonbridge, but pronounced Tunbridge. Uh, there's a castle there, Tunbridge Castle. That is our finish point. And that, incidentally, is also the start of the third walk in this book the medway valley walk so we'll be doing that at some point we're hoping to try and wild camp in some woodland sort of near heaver castle tonight so i've got my terranova laser competition one tent out with me for tonight nice little lightweight tent luke you've got your i've got a brand new fox v v21 or whatever it's called by OEX. Look, yeah, I mean, it's the second version, but a one man, but like one man tent. The little green. It's still got its tags on. I haven't even taken it out of the bag yet. So that's going to be nice. <laughs> we're going to have a look at that later on, hopefully. We get a, a shift on. We're heading towards, we think it's either Cern's Farm or Kern's Farm. We don't really know the pronunciation. Heading towards there because this one starts basically, yeah, in the middle of nowhere. I'm looking forward to it. So enough talking let's, let's get walking, get walking. <laughs> eden valley is very rural and in the past has seen prosperity from iron production in tudor times from agricultural production for the london market and from the leather industry human occupation has a long history there was an iron age camp at dry hill a couple of miles south of kern's farm and Eden Bridge High Street was originally part of the Roman road from London to Lewis, built partly to transport the products of the even earlier Roman iron industry. The Eden Valley Walk is not maintained and waymarked everywhere to the highest standard, especially west of Hever. The lakes and surrounding woodland of Gabriel's fishery are man-made and were created in the early years of the 20th century on what was previously arable farmland and meadow. In 2012, the development was presented with an award by Kent Wildlife Trust for its contribution to wildlife diversity, especially wildflowers, birds and butterflies. East Haxted Farm Airstrip is apparently used for microlites. There was an air accident report of an incident in July 2016 when a 90 year old pilot attempting to abort a landing in turbulent conditions found himself and his microlite in an oak tree some five metres above ground from where he had to be rescued by the emergency services. So we're not far into the walk, we've come across this little grass airstrip and there's this World War II pillbox situated right by the sort of runway if you can call it, the grass strip area. So this pillbox could have been built maybe to defend an airfield or airstrip here during the war. It could have been like a dummy airfield, you know, so that the Germans would like drop their ordnance here and then of course they'd give away their position at night time and you know our guys would shoot them down or something we're not sure anyway but so bear in mind this is an airstrip Luke has just climbed up on top of this pillbox which is blocked uh, the doors blocked off so you can't get in it 
apparently there's a helipad up there so helicopters land on the pillbox here at this airstrip that's quite cool These are believed to be the shallow remains of a moat around the site which may once have contained a farmstead, now known as the Devil's Den. in Edenbridge. It's a lovely old town with lots of history including this very fine old stone bridge here. Really really warm at the moment, quite sort of humid, a little bit muggy. We're seeing a lot more of the river now, it's widened a bit more since we left Gabriel's Fisheries I think it's called, where the airstrip was and the pillbox with a helipad on it. Eden Bridge straddles the old Roman road from London to Lewis and the town was originally called Edhelm's Bridge and gave its name to the river rather than the other way round. Edhelm was an abbot from Canterbury who ordered the building of the first proven bridge here in 1125. There are plenty of pubs, a museum and some fine old buildings such as Doggett's Barn now the home of Edenbridge Town Council. From the 15th century until 1974, leather production was a major activity in the town. The river provided the needed quantities of water, while the bark of the oaks that grow so well on the clay of the low weald provided the tannin. Well, this is a turn up for the books. We have just come across the remains of a Cold War ROC post, a little underground bunker, and the remains of a Cold War Orlit Tower, like a, a little raised platform they would have used to spot uh, planes, enemy planes and stuff, you know, if they was dropping like a nuclear weapon. There's loads of them all over the country. Um, I've got loads of videos on ROC posts, Royal Observer Corps posts on the channel. So if you're new to the channel, have a look for them, check them out. I've explored some pretty cool ones. It was basically like a, a small, almost like one room, um, underground room where they could apparently safely monitor um, a, a nuclear bomb if it was dropped. Of course, during the Cold War, there was the threat of nuclear weapons being used against the country. And yeah, the Royal Observer Corps were, you know, like a, a group set up. And yeah, one of the tasks was they'd have, I think, three, three people down there monitoring um, the bomb blast if it went off. Apparently it's safe down there. I don't know about that. I wouldn't want to stay down there if nuclear bomb had gone off. And they'd have like monitoring equipment on the, the surface level here. And of course it would all run down into the into the post and they could safely monitor like the power of the bomb like the uh the magnitude of it stuff like that I'm, I'm not a nuclear physicist so i haven't got a clue i don't think it's gonna open oh it does as well no way is it ladder still in place or I've got to go down there. I've got to check that out. That is so cool. 
wow and then not as interesting i know but yeah that's the remains of the as i say like a, it's almost like a, a concrete tree house really um i've seen a few more that are in far better condition in fact i found um an old flare box in one of them in hertfordshire i wonder if there's a geocache here yeah, there could be. People do hide geocaches in there. In fact, I found a geocache in one of them. Anyways, right, I'm waffling on. This is exciting. We're going to get head tools out and go and have a look in there, I think. We, we can't ignore this. We've got to explore it, definitely. Oh, and there's more bits of it. The ventilation shaft and stuff as well. What a find. There he goes. Here we go. It's one of the great escape, isn't it? It is a little bit. I always forget how tight these uh, passageways are. Well, it is pretty badly flooded down here. Yeah. Right, there's not a hell of a lot to see in this one. You can see the uh, ventilation hatch at the end there. That's going to probably be seized open. They usually are. You can never budge them with the rust. And there's a lot of stagnant standing water down here as well. Uh, it's been completely gutted, all the stuff's been ripped out. But if you look up, up there, you can just see there, that's where some of like the, the uh, bomb measuring equipment, like the bomb power indicator, the fixed survey meter, um, I can't remember the other names of them, but they would have come down through the ground to there, down to like a, a table here. They would have monitored as I say, like the power of the bomb and stuff like that from, from here. And then over the back was usually like some bunk beds. And then I'll turn around here. Ooh, this little room here would have been the Kazi. So you would have had a chemical toilet. In fact, I don't know if you can actually see it. There's that green drum there. That looks like the chemical toilet. The remains of it, that's quite cool. I've seen one of those intact though before. It's probably a couple of bits from the actual uh, the actual post still down here. I don't know if that's one of the old mattresses. It's pretty cool. But yeah, this one's been completely gutted and it looks like it's probably a bit fire damaged as well. And then here you've got uh, like a water pump sump. So, of course, this hatch up here, this shaft that goes up to the, the hatch to get in, of course, it would have let water in. There would have been a grill under here, like a drain. The water would have, rainwater would have collected in there, and then they could use that to pump it out as well. That's pretty cool. So, that's sort of vaguely intact. But yeah, and I've seen much better condition ROC posts, but. It's always good to find another one of these. All right, let's head back up to the top. We just spent ages at that ROC post and uh, there was like a young couple there that had also come looking for it to explore it and we literally arrived at it at exactly the same time. So we got chatting and 
um they was like oh you got interesting camera setups and i was like yeah we you know we film for youtube and stuff you know so they've given us a subscribe and a follow thank you very much thanks guys cool people love it it's always good to meet like-minded people and yeah, and just that moment of excitement of like finding an ROC boat. I was like a little kid. I was like, we've got to go in there. And I mean, even though there was bug rule in there, it was really cool. We'll uh, we'll probably see you in Hever. Yeah, something cool turns up along the way. <laughs> yeah, like another ROC post. <laughs> Hever Station was the scene of the Mark Beach Riots in 1866 when English navvies attacked lower paid French workers during the construction of the railway line. This is Chippen's Bank. In the early 20th century the house and model farm were the home of Ethel Everest, the daughter of the surveyor after whom the Himalayan mountain is named. Here she would host visits by students from London's Morley College and from London's Slum Dwellers, the latter organised by Emma Cons and her niece Lillian Bayliss, who later became a renowned theatrical producer. Hever Castle was built in 1462 by Thomas Bullen, or Bullen, whose daughters Anne and Mary became Henry VIII's wife and mistress respectively. The castle was the principal home of Anne of Cleves for the 17 years from the annulment of her marriage to Henry VIII until her death in 1557, after which it fell into decay. It was bought in 1903 by American millionaire William Waldorf Astor, who carefully restored it and had the lake created. He also built the Tudor style village to provide additional luxury accommodation now used for conferences and other events. It's gone 6 pm. We've arrived a lot later than expected, but we're here in Hever and we can see the King Henry VIII pub ahead of us. I cannot wait to get in there, it's been so hot. This is the Henry VIII pub in Hever. The building proudly sports the date 1597, but apparently this is the date of the first inn on the site, the present building dating from 1647. The parish records supposedly state that the inn was originally called the Bull and Butcher and given its present name in 1848. However, when the author, Richard Church, passed this way in the 1940s, he referred to it as the Berlin Arms. In the 1980s, the pub was owned by a gangster associate of the craze, George Francis, who in 1985 was shot while behind the bar. He survived, only to be killed by a gunman in East London in 2003. Fear not, the pub is respectable and welcoming to walkers now. <laughs> so I've got um, half an Orchard View cider. It's not bad, they didn't really have anything else, so um, I'll give it a little review for you. It's quite dry, I say medium dry. I'm going to give it about a 5.5 out of 10. Game changer though is this pint of Coke, ice and a slice. That is getting a 9.5 out of 10. It's so refreshing. We've had um, some crisps already, probably the nicest crisps ever. Very Tyrrells. Tyrrells, very posh very crisps. Cheesy. Yeah, we ate them. Um, Luke's got a pint of San Miguel. Two. Is it? It's. There we go, there it is, just coming into shot. I'm so hungry, I could eat the arse off a low flying duck. <laughs> <laughs> Wash out low flying ducks. <laughs> We're going to enjoy these drinks. Cheers, everyone. We've just left the King Henry VIII pub, which is literally across the road here in Hever. And they very kindly filled up all of our water bottles as well. 
So we're at Hever Church, and it was built about 750 years ago to replace a former early Norman church. It's been a place of prayer here for at least 850 years. What a long time. Apparently in the church as well is the tomb of Sir Thomas Bullen, who was the father of Anne Bullen, Anne Boleyn of course, and grandfather of Queen Elizabeth I. How cool is that? Heading off on the path and we've got to start looking for somewhere to pitch up for the night. It's probably about half seven now. It's not going to get dark till nine o'clock, but we want to be pitched up before then. We've come off of the Eden Valley walk ever so slightly and we found a pretty decent little bit of woodland. Um, no fences or sign of like you know, human activity here and stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's the, the best thing we've, we've found really so far. And we're far enough off the path and deep enough into the woods that we're not going to be spotted. I mean, you can barely see the sun setting through the trees there. Um, it drops off down that side, so we're higher up. It does, yeah. So we basically climbed up a steep bank off of the path so that we're on higher ground. So if you was walking along the path, you wouldn't actually be able to see us, even if we were relatively close to the edge of the the rise. Um, but then we've just gone further and further into the woods, completely out of sight. So there's like the footpaths are far enough away from us basically um, I think we'll be all right here we found some flat level sort of clear ground here to set up right let's get the shelter set up all right well that was probably the trickiest pitch I've ever had to do with this Terranova laser comp one and I'm going to be honest with you like I always thought it was like my dream tent but I'm actually really starting to hate this tent in a way because I think where Terranova have cut weight to make it a light tent it's like they've just they've just gone after that goal of making it a lightweight tent at the cost of making it like easy to pitch it is so difficult to pitch. Now, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or not. Any Terranova Laser Comp 1 owners out there, get in the comments and let me know. But I find the the footprint that I bought for it, the Terranova footprint, the inner and the outer don't marry up properly. It is an absolute nightmare. The little guy lines at the ends for them, they don't, they don't match up. You know, you, they have to all be at different lengths and you have to peg them out at different angles and stuff. And you end up having to use a ton of pegs. And even then, you get stuff like this where it's all like saggy and laying on the inner. And do you know, I'm past caring now. I mean, it probably means I might get a bit of condensation in there because, of course, there's no gap between them. But do you know what? Like, I'm actually looking at Luke's brand new little Fox 1 V2. And like, it won't mind me saying this, it's a cheaper tent, right, a much cheaper tent. You think these are like, what, 250, 300 quid? I mean, I paid 185 for this and it was next to new. And I'm actually looking at that OEX thinking, do you know what? I'd rather have that on this camp because it's not raining. So you can use a pitch in a first tent, which the Fox One is. This thing is just a nightmare. I kind of think at the end of end of a long day's walking and you know you pitch up you don't want to be you know piss balling about with a tent trying to set it up you want something easy that just goes up like that get your food on done that's it i don't want to be fanning around with this thing and it's getting really annoying and um, that's not to say i regret buying it because like i said i've always wanted to own one of these and you know i saved up the money and pulled the trigger on it and went go for it and i've had some good camps with it but it's, I find the pitching very temperamental. Um, and there's just so many things that I think could be improved on it. And it wouldn't incur much more weight added to it. If if any, really. You might be able to cut some weight off of it. Who knows? But just a lot of things that are 
and not quite right with it so yeah it's lightweight and i think that's probably the reason why most people buy one is because they're lightweight but do you know what they're so annoying i'd rather carry the extra weight you know um maybe have some less space to sit up in and stuff i, I can deal with that it's fine you know i don't want to be stressed out with this tent I, it's pissed me off anyway as you can tell ran over we're just going to deal with it tent purists out there swivel i know you're going to go that is awful tom you should be ashamed of yourself who cares i'm going to crack open a cider and be happy we've got another fire pot meal this one is the or orzo pasta bolognese so spag bowl basically British beef slow cooked in a rich tomato and oregano sauce served with rice shaped pasta and then for dessert we've got a banker absolute brilliant adventure foods chocolate mousse I've had this before and it's absolutely lovely uh, stove tonight is I've literally bought one stove with me for once not like a backup or anything I've literally got one stove so I know it works though there's no wind in here so I've got a windshield don't need it though and it's that it's one of two um, homemade alcohol stoves with like the, the carbon felt in it my mate Hambo very kindly made me this from a, a boot polish tin uh, there's a slightly smaller one he made me but I went with a bigger one and then he also made me this ultralight wire pot stand um, a little triangle like that bit of, tin, heavy. bit of tin foil down I've got three bottles of meths this is a good little hack I got like a normal scouring um, sponge thing and just cut it in half made a little mini scouring pad so I can clean up my pots I thought that was really cool. I felt very ultra light doing that. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's lighter ways of doing it, but anyway, uh, we've got like stormproof light of uh, what's it, a ferro rod, some matches somewhere, and then pots. Keeping it light. Out kit, 650 mil titanium pot. That's to cook. Well, I say cooking. We're boiling water here. It's not, you know. Gordon Ramsay's job's not threatened um, and then we've got an outkit titanium 400 mil mug to drink out of but I mean you just eat out of pouches so yeah um, ask me cook set because you know you might ask questions about it and well there you go that's it um, old cider I'll quickly show you that while I've got the filming light so this one is oh, you probably can't see it because the glare read it to you it's easier so it's an Alska cider, so that means it comes from Aldi's, very cheap shop here in the UK. Peach and honeydew melon, 4%. Have one of these at home, it was rather nice, but I've got to review it for you. Bang. <laughs> Good, smells very sweet, doesn't Hang smell on. like cider before at you, all. Go on. Before you have a little bit of that, oh, go on. give it a go. Have a try, up. yeah, that's it, because of course, you know, we can't be sharing drinks you know so you know unfortunately mark i can't snog you yet so anyway so i'm just pouring a little bit in luke's mug how do well, well, well. i might not like it <laughs> anyways cheers well it smells good it does smell good doesn't it yeah that's really nice it's good isn't it it's really peachy well you can't have any more because i've just had a sip out of it <laughs> bollocks it is good isn't it yeah, yeah. I like that. peach honeydew melon just goes really well together one of the best ones from Alska I reckon and it's in these slightly bigger cans as well which is nice it just tastes like normal fruit juice doesn't it it does I mean it doesn't taste like alcohol at all I mean you could have a load of them and not know you're getting pissed but what would you give it out of 10 oh that's got to be like an 8 that's really nice oh okay that's good I want to give it an 8.75 it's very good I'll show you like breakfast and snacks tomorrow morning. I can't be bothered with that. I'm still getting over that tent. <laughs> so <laughs> I had the uh, the Orzo pasta bolognese by Firepot. Um, it was nice. I probably maybe could have added a little bit more water to it because it was a little bit dry. Um, Flavours, 
started off bland and it got a bit more exciting as it went on um yeah it wasn't bad i definitely preferred it over the like chili con carne thing that yeah it was okay but i still think they're a bit bland and it because the pasta is like <coughs> rice shaped it just tasted like you was eating rice really rather than pasta so it was a bit strange but it was all right i would give it I know a 6.75 out of 10, maybe a 7. This uh, chocolate mousse <coughs> by Adventure Foods, um, once again, didn't put too much water in it, and I've like made it quite thick and stuff, and it is really nice, really tasty. This is like as good as a chocolate mousse you'd have at home or in a restaurant. Maybe better, I think, because there's little chocolate bits in it as well. Hopefully the tent's going to be all right, despite me doing a shoddy pitch job on it um yeah we're just literally finishing up food i'm gonna i'm gonna make up a little uh night time sleepy time tea get in the tent hit the sack and we've got to be up early between half five and six <coughs> i reckon i'm probably gonna leave it at that actually i think um yeah i'll see you in the morning everyone bright and early oh mosquitoes eating me now oh my god what Anyways, enough oh, yawning. I'll get out of there. You can get I'll out of there. In, the in your shorts as well. Yeah, they're oh. gonna they're gonna get up there. Anyway, enough yawning. I'll see you in the morning. Night all. Morning everyone, it's 20 past 6, myself and Luke were up at about 5.30 I think, and I'm just going to do some breakfast now, which consists of another adventure food dehydrated meal, this one is Nuspa, or Cuspa, however you say it, probably Nuspa, muesli, 600 calories, uh, crunchy muesli, and it says you have cold water in it i might actually have that hot i reckon that would probably taste better hot i mean i think either either it'll work i'm gonna go with i think i'm gonna go with hot actually i think i've had it before and it was it was all right it was pretty good uh, hot drinks i'll have like a hot chocolate or a, a tea one or two and then i've got various snacks and stuff throughout the day like some beef jerky some instant mashed potatoes some cup of soups a uh, couple of energy bars protein bars stuff like that so i've got enough for like a lunch because we've got a lot of well i say we've got a lot we've got about nine miles to do today i've got one more drink with me a celebratory drink for the end i'll show you that later on luke was really impressed with his his little Fox One tent, the version 2, the V2 by OEX. Really likes it. Um, I have to admit, it's, it's tempting me to to buy one. Because I used to own like the first generation ones, the black and red ones. Um, sold that to my mate Richard. I'm tempted to get either the one man version of this or the two man um, I'm sort of undecided at the moment whether I'll keep it or not it's a different matter but I just thought it'd be good to have something different for a little bit and see what I think of it I can always sell it on um, oh yeah and Luke's climate mat he really liked as well um, so it's, it's the same as mine except his is the summer version so it's the climate static V not the insulated one and yeah he said it was really comfy really good and he slept really well so i think it was about 
40, 44 quid on Amazon. And it comes from America, but of course Amazon have got some sort of deal where you, you don't have to pay like, like import taxes and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to look into getting one of them. So I've got a, a summer mat and I'm not relying on my winter mat. Um, I slept, I slept all right. I've slept better, but I would say since the lockdown back at wild camping, this is one of the better nights sleep I've had. So that was pretty good. We picked a flat, comfy spot for a change. <laughs> that's about it, really. But that's that's that Nuspa muesli dry. Anyways, right. Enough yakking and let's get snacking. We've got to crack on. Shortly before reaching Hill Hoth, the path passes between fine outcrops of Ardingly sandstone, which was laid down in a river delta about 135 million years ago. It is particularly resistant to weathering, other outcrops of the same stone in the southeast being very popular with climbers. It is tempting to interpret the corridor-like route as the remains of an ancient trackway worn down by the passage of people and vehicles across the centuries, and some writers have done so. However, careful examination of the rock faces reveals chisel marks. Perhaps the stone was quarried for building. Perhaps it was removed to create part of the old coach road, or perhaps both. Withers at Hill Hoth is a Grade 2 listed 15th century timber framed building, probably a hall house, once housing the village laundry. Claimed by some to be the prettiest village in Kent, Chiddingstone boasts a 14th century church, much restored after a fire in 1624, and an unspoiled row of 16th to 17th century houses many half-timbered or tile-hung, much used for films and television dramas. The nearby Chiding Stone may, or more probably may not, have given the village its name. The stone may, or may not, have been used by villagers as a place to chide wrongdoers and nagging wives. Chiding Stone Castle was once the manor house, and belonged to the Streetfield family for many centuries, their wealth stemming from the Wealdon iron industry. It was rebuilt in 1679 in a pseudo medieval style. The main street which used to run past the manor was blocked off and diverted round the castle grounds. Said to be the finest medieval mansion in Kent, Penshurst Place has since 
1552, been the home of the Sydney family. It was previously owned by the Stafford family, the Dukes of Buckingham, but the last in the line was beheaded. The house was confiscated by the Crown and given to Sir William Sidney for his loyal service. The most famous of the Sidneys, Sir Philip, was born here in 1554 and became a poet and soldier in the time of Elizabeth I. The house boasts a great hall dating from the 14th century, an armoury, a tapestry room and a long gallery. There is a tea room, the Porcupine Pantry. A porcupine has long been a feature of the Sydney coat of arms. We're just outside Penshurst Church at the moment. Sunday services aren't the moment, so we won't be going in. But this here I want to point out to you is really cool. So this is a medieval dole table. And according to the sign, it's one of only a handful to survive in English churchyards. So a dole was a, a small portion of food, clothing or money that was placed on the table for the poor on special occasions, such as like St Thomas's Day, which is the 21st December each year. That's quite a nice little could be why. thing. It's called the Dole Office. Possibly, possibly. For the poor, it's the handouts for the poor. Good call, good call, yeah. But yeah, you do not see too many of them. It looks like a like a, a tomb. It's cool, isn't it? Pretty cool. I think it was in my day walk video round here with Candy. So watch that again if you want. But yeah, that's what that is. So lovely church, this. Um, yeah, like I say, we won't be going in because there's a service going on. We've got probably about three miles to go and we've left the River Eden now which we've been following for most of the way and we've now joined up with the River Medway, the mighty River of Kent and yeah, basically the Eden flows into this and then of course the Medway flows through Tunbridge where we're going to now so we'll be following the Medway until then and then of course for our next walk from this book that we're doing that's the Medway Valley Walk that's 30 miles and that is from Tunbridge uh, up to Rochester following the River Medway that's going to be brilliant that walk I cannot wait to do it uh, probably a three-day walk I reckon we two wild camps and it's just yeah it's gonna be good it's been a really good book this of course we did the Darren Valley Path recently that was the first walk from it so if you want to check that out, see if I'll stick a link up there for you to watch. It's a two-parter.
shit hole. We are now on what is known as the Straight Mile. The Medway had been made navigable up to Tunbridge in the 1740s. In 1829, a group led by James Christie set up the Penshurst Canal Company to extend the navigation to Penshurst and beyond. However, legal disputes with the Medway Navigation Company, which controlled the section from Medway to Tunbridge, and even fighting between the staff of the two companies bankrupted Christie's venture, leaving the straight mile dug but not filled with water. Christie fled to America, leaving huge debts, and the straight mile is now cut in two by Hazden Water. Hazden Water is the result of gravel extraction in the 1970s. The 1.3 km long, 5 m high earth embankment was built in 1982 to create the Lee Flood Storage Area, which can be used to control the flow of the Medway through Tunbridge and reduce flooding risk at times of high rainfall. Steel gates across the Medway, where it flows through the embankment, can be closed so that water collects upstream of the barrier, flooding up to 686 acres of pasture west of Hazden Water. The storage capacity is around 5 million cubic metres of water. On the 24th of December 2013, water levels were within 10 millimetres of the maximum and water had to be released with some homes flooded as a result. Literally just got accidentally spat on as I entered Tunbridge. <laughs> this family was walking past and you know, socially distanced and all that, and he was talking to them. <laughs> Literally, as we walked past, he just accidentally spat, got me in the side of the face. And there it is, just up there is the, the mot, the, the keep at Tunbridge Castle. You know what that means. We've made it, we've completed the Eden Valley walk. Yes. Luke's uh, about half Katie has turned up to uh, kindly give us a lift back to theirs where my car's parked. So I briefly stopped here with uh, Candice on the way back from uh, another day walk, not that long ago actually, and just got some photos and stuff and yeah, I was looking forward to coming back here. It's a pretty cool castle actually. There's a lot more sort of standing here than still standing than I actually thought. So pretty cool little place. Tunbridge Castle was founded in the 11th century and much of it was demolished in the Civil War. The castle's chief surviving feature is the gatehouse, considered one of the finest in the country and now housing council offices including the visitor information centre. So as we're at the end of the walk here at Tunbridge Castle it's time for the celebratory cider. I've been saving this one specially. So it's a brother's pink grapefruit, 4% the magic number. Hopefully it's not too shook up. Oh that smells absolutely lovely. So uh Cheers Luke. Cheers mate. I'll open my beer in a second. Oh, first sip refreshment. That's absolutely lovely. Just finished a crate of them at home. Mm. Grapefruit makes it extra refreshing. It's not too uh, 
too sour it's just right I'm gonna give that it's worth of a 9.6 I reckon it's a strong contender I'm glad I saved this for the end mm. cheers mate cheers I'm not mine because I'm gonna do mine on my video oh and that's uh, <laughs> another one that I got Luke twice as nice, twice as nice. double RPA 6.6 percent frothing so yeah had a good two days uh, I think it was it was better than we expected wasn't it the walk yeah definitely definitely we thought it was going to be the like the more boring one of the three in the book but actually it was full of history full of stuff to see Ugh. and the camp weren't too bad either no. not for my tent it was a pain in the ass to set up but hey ho no it was all good we got lucky with that spot in the woods as well um, so the next one we're going to be doing is the Medway Valley Walk. Which starts from here. I starts think. from here, all the way to Rochester. So following River Medway, that's 30 miles, three days, so two camps. And yeah, we're really looking forward to that one. So I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you very much for watching and joining us. It's been a pleasure. Get in the comments, let us know what you think. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Look after each other, stay safe. I will see you soon. Cheers. Bye. Say bye, Luke. Bye, Luke. <laughs> Adios, amigos. <laughs>